of Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk, a Torah Institute podcast. Torah just means instruction in Hebrew. At Torah Talk, we will make straight the ways of Yahuwah and discuss the simple truths of Scripture so that even you can understand and get all the juicy life hidden within the pages of Yahuwah's Torah. Welcome to Torah Talk with Lou White and Mark Davidson. <laughs> Hey! Hey! There he is! How's it going? There's no now let's see, there's uh... You had a microphone plugged in, you can't hear it. Oh, I've got my headphones plugged in. <laughs> I can't read hand signals either. Look at these scary headphones. Oh, yeah. I just picked these up about a week ago. Nice age. Let me unplug it. Oh, okay. yeah. Hi, brother. How are you guys? Hello, hello. Oh, can you hear me yet? Yes. Fantastic. I better turn you up a little. But he he can't figure out how to be able to see his. Yeah, I don't know where I'm at. His but, picture you know, while he's looking at you. That? Oh, there I am. There you are. What's Just that? click on that. Just click oh, on that. I'm in the picture. Oh, I'm out of here. Bye. <laughs> okay. Well. Here we go. How was your week? Oh, it's been a full-on week. Busy, busy. Yeah? Yeah. Well, Shabbat Shalom to you. Thank you very Shabbat much. Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat uh, Shalom. Actually, the, uh, during the time we're going to be recording, probably, Sabbath will arise here. Wonderful. You know? So it'll be it's sunset. You know, I think it's 640. Yes. So how's your? how do you do your lighting? Uh, I've just got this is a fluorescent light up in the ceiling. That's oh, okay. All, that's all. It's very different today because it's daytime out there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, normally it's nighttime. So yeah. So we, we've it's switched. We've, we've switched it around, brothers and sisters. We've switched it around. It's now uh, coming into nighttime for Lou, and it's uh, morning time for me. So I'll be the groggy one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I might be groggy too, but uh, I'm groggy all the time. <laughs> but I'm not as groggy as I would be, though. <laughs> I totally understand. Yeah, I was uh, heard myself saying uh, some really strange things, you know, <laughs> backwards letters and you know words coming out of nowhere. Yeah, you were tired uh, last week, weren't you? Oh, last week it was. I was so tired. Yeah, I had and I had a pretty good week this week. Uh, I rested uh, fairly well, but I had a hard, uh, you know, a lot of work to do. Last week, though, I had to work an extra day, so I had to, well, I don't mind working six days. You know, the girl that we have that works for us had to have some time off because she was moving. Yeah. So I uh, said, I'll do it, you know, not a problem. So uh, now what is, what is this uh, place that we're in here? Well, we're we're standing up on we're sitting up on top of a high mountain, and uh, looking down behind us, you can see the hanging gardens. Down there, yeah. the hanging gardens of Babylon. We're in Babylon this week. Unbelievable! And uh, you might see a few ships go past a little uh, down the river. Uh, yeah, amazing. Tory oh, Institute. Tory Institute has sent us to Babylon. <laughs> 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 that's amazing yeah so uh, I wanted to ask you if you if you knew anything about the seven wonders of the world did you uh, welcome to Torah Talk brothers and sisters number 14 now we're uh, we're back on the radio apparently well I don't think we left but um, I don't think I got to tell you um, we did about six shows and remember I said to you I'm not going to put them on the the audio files anymore because I don't think they're using them. Well, I uh, I got in trouble. I got an email from Christopher, the the uh, the guy who runs the state, the Na Nazarene 
network radio station and he said, we've been playing your last one for the last few weeks. When's the next one coming out? And uh, so I'd stop making them and stop sending them because I didn't, I thought maybe they changed their mind or they weren't, you know, because you're a pretty controversial fellow. So I thought maybe they didn't want to do it anymore. Turns out they've been doing it, they must have just started a few weeks later than what I thought. And uh, they'd been doing it all along. So I, we're, we're now making shows and 11 o'clock p.m. every third day, fifth day and seventh day, we're on the air. Nazarene Radio Network. For an hour. Wow. So that's it? wonderful. Yeah. So it's a radio. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. That would be your time, I'm guessing. Probably, yeah. I don't know, but I'm I'm on Eastern Standard Time, uh, and there's four time zones here, hmm. and of course. Uh, Do you know where that that where those guys are? Would they be near you, same timing as you guys? Are? No, I really don't know. Uh, let me let me think for a second. Now, if uh, if he's any well, they can be anywhere on the planet. In fact, they can be in orbit. You know, <laughs> really, with the internet. Yeah. So. You know, I guess they uh, they haven't ever really, I, I mean, I'm sure we could research where their uh, mailing address is, but uh, James Trim, his location is Texas, and he's uh, one hour earlier than we are here, I believe. Okay. I believe he's in uh, Hearst, Texas, yeah. and I don't know if the uh, rest of the fellows there are anywhere near him, but, mm. you know. Anyway, so yeah, we're on radio, so we're putting them back onto uh, into audio files now, and uh, so we've got to edit it down to an hour. <laughs> okay then. Well, let's see. I hope we don't waste anyone's time. But uh, you wanted to talk about some uh, interesting things today, like the seven wonders of the world. You yeah. Know, and uh, what would be the uh, oldest one? Does anyone in the audience know? I think in the witchcraft seminar, if you all go to YouTube and watch the witchcraft seminar, you'll find that I do touch on that in one of the frames. And the oldest one, and the, the, the seven ancient wonders of the world, the oldest one, I, I believe it's the, the Great Pyramid of Egypt, at Giza, and it is 2,000 years older than all of the rest of the other six ancient wonders. And that's amazing. Wow. And, uh, you know, the, a lot of the brothers and scientists believe that the, the three pyramids that depict, a, a, according to some, the three stars in Orion's belt, which is actually associated sometimes with Nimrod or, um, you know, different, different things. But they say that those are actually signals or signs or signposts that they understood the workings of the, you know, not necessarily the constellations as we understand today, but the uh, signs in the heavens, you know, people have written books and made all kinds of applications of things, but uh, it's my belief, now it might not be true, but I believe that the pyramids, the three pyramids that we see there in Egypt at Giza are, are the original pyramids and they came from before the flood. They were there. You know, the, the crustaceans that are all at the same level that are found uh, apparently when this flood was coming down and the water hovered at a certain level. There's actually sea life at, a, at one area of all three pyramids and, the, and it's inside too, you know. But of course that's uh, brought to bear in a, in a movie and you can probably watch it on the internet. I think it's called The Pillars of Enoch or The Pillar of Enoch something like that. And I don't uh, have a lot of information on that, but you can watch it. Now that gentleman has got some information. I think that there's, there's probably some things that are in there that are, that are fanciful, but uh, there's some good information there. And anyway, in, in doing some studies about that, uh, these pyramids are made out of such large stones and we still can't engineer them. In fact, the Great Pyramid is still the largest structure Made not necessarily strong, the tallest, but the largest single human made structure. If they were, in fact, humans, they could have been those uh, Nephilim characters. 
I don't know. But, you know, when I look at the pyramids, in fact, when I was a very young boy and I was looking at the structure of the Great Pyramid, I was often, well, I was aware of the fact that it had been polished at one time and part of its original coating is still there, but it's not completely intact. But it was a highly polished item. And it was supposedly all white. And it was beautiful. Or possibly a golden color. But it was a very highly polished stone covering that's been removed for the most part. Some of it still is up. You can see it in the pictures up at the top. But the uh, pyramid itself and the use of the pyramid and the purpose of the pyramid was always a mystery. And no one alive, uh, at least on this side of the flood, seems to know anything about the origin or the builders or anything. Of course, the Masons will tell you they, do, they know because they were Masons. Uh, <laughs> that's secret information. The secrets of the ancients have been handed down. And in order to know them, you've got to become a 33rd degree. But um, that's nonsense. The fact is, though, that those things, if I were building an object like that, now that's just my personal view, if I were building an object like that, I would probably be building it because there was danger, and I would be building a fortress. And it wasn't a temple, obviously, although it could be, but I don't, I don't see it as a temple. But if it is, a, if it is any kind of a temple or an object within a temple, it would possibly be referred, being referred to at Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 19, verse 19, starting at verse 19. Because, uh, you know, I'll, I can read a little bit of that later to you, but in, in general, though, it looks like a fortress. And in the ancient world, the descendants of, of Seth, Seth, yeah. you know, the one that was born that was some time after Abel was slain, and the son Seth was of the righteous line. Hmm. And apparently his descendants, or possibly even him, were involved in designing this structure. You know, I don't know. That's one of the myths, you know, or the sayings that people have surmised over the years. But, you know, that's possible. But that's the oldest of all the seven wonders, that pyramid. Those hmm. three pyramids, really. You know, but... Uh, let me, let me have a look at these. The seven wonders of the ancient world happen to be the pyramids, that's plural, at Giza, and they're over 2,000 years older than all the rest. Yeah. And the next one is the Colossus at Rhodes, which was actually a statue of the Greek deity H-E-L-O-S, or H-E-L-I-O-S. And then the lighthouse at Alexandria, and the statue of Z-E-U-S at Olympia. And the mausoleum of Halicarnassus, mausoleum of Halicarnassus. It was a mausoleum that was built for a king. And um, the temple of A-R-T-M-I-S. Now that was the temple of this deity that was mentioned at, at Ephesus in the book of Acts. Yeah. And then the seventh one is right here that apparently we are sitting in the midst of. It's the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, or Babel. Hmm. Anyway, it's all uh, associated basically with mankind's monumental infatuation with witchcraft. Yes. You know, or de demonic uh, activity. Hmm. But not necessarily the pyramid. See, we, we aren't really sure about that. Because the pyramids may or may not be associated with any sort of idolatry. Hmm. I mean, some people have fancied that, but eh, there's not really any hard evidence of that, you know, because no one knows why they were built or who built them, hmm. you know, the original. We've always associated the pyramids with Mitzrayim, and Mitzrayim was obviously, yeah. you know. Nobody well, if you really, look... <laughs> nobody really likes Egypt, do they? <laughs> well, yeah, if you, but you see, to judge that, area by what we see there would be the same way to be judging the, let's say the state of the, the, the country of Turkey yeah. by the faith or the belief system that resides there today hmm. or the, for that matter that resides anywhere because that changes with the population and hmm. when a population is conquered 
and the belief system is imposed on them, you know, you can't really judge the structures that are around based on those kinds of facts. Mm. But uh, it is interesting. But those are the seven ancient wonders of the world. And, of course, the one that's the most mystifying is the one that's the largest human structure ever made in history. Uh, the stones on the thing are, are, are several uh, hundreds of tons, you know, each. And so how would you uh, engineer a thing like that, you know? So you reckon it must have been uh, tampered with creatures, tampered creatures, Nephilim or... Do you reckon that would well, come into play? Yeah. And if well, so, and if so, how how would they control them enough to get them to build it? Well, unless they built it themselves and they were motivated to do so, that would be one possibility. And then we could hypothetically these are all hypotheticalized uh, ideas. But <clears throat> what if you had a a normal sized human being that was afraid of the giants, and they wanted to build something? Well, it would be really hard to do. But if they had technology that maybe is in advance of where we are now, and they could do that, and then they built this thing for protection. You know, certainly the pharaohs of Egypt didn't have anything to do with the original pyramids. They were, the, the other pyramids were just mimicking what was there, and they're crumbling. Uh, they say, when I was going through college, they were telling me that the pyramid at Saqqara was the oldest pyramid ever known, and it was the first of the pyramids because it had a step it was called the step pyramid, you know, mm. and it, because it had all these different layers, like a layer cake. Mm. But, you know, I was thinking, no, that, that's unlikely because the Great Pyramid's not crumbling, and that one is. So apparently somebody was trying to copy it, and it just looks old. Yeah. And, of course, they'll tell you it's older because, it, oh, look how old it looks. But, uh, you know, where would archaeologists, this, you know. Where would this advanced technology have come from? Aliens? Oh, no, no, alien, maybe the spatial beings, yeah, the Malachim, the fallen Malachim. But you see, the technology was probably at least as advanced as we are today. See, because all the wars have been really the thing that kept us from advancing. We could have been on the moon by the 1500s if it had not been for all the, you know, the dark ages and all the, you know, the murdering and invading and just uh, you know the you know the dragon trying to control everybody, but um, that's amazing. I you, days. Yeah, you there were, was a hundred million people there uh, that were supposedly drowned at the time of the fur of the deluge. You know that's what the estimates are that there were a hundred million people living on the surface of the earth, and they all perished because. You know, they were violent, you know. And, of course, before the flood, the uh, areas we call Antarctica and, and, and North, the North Pole and all these areas, day and night had a very nice temperature. Uh, they were, there's, I mean, when they discover the, um, that uh, there's oil shale and, and coal and things like that down in Antarctica and evidence of vegetation that had been there at one time, that before the flood, the, the earth was a completely different sort of environment. And so the, pers the amount of arable land and the jungles, it must have been amazing, you know. Wow. That's but amazing. But today, you have a terrible time, you know, just getting the land to do anything, you know. Mm. That's amazing. You reckon we could have been on the moon five, six hundred years ago? Well, technologically, I'm, I'm speaking. I don't really want to go to the moon, but unless I've got my immortal body. But to try to, you know, pump a little vessel full of enough air and food and supplies and protection to get to the moon is pointless, really, to me. But a lot of people think it, it's a great idea. But techno technologically, they could have been further along than us now. Uh, I mean, the evidence of that pyramid is wow. standing there looking at us and... That's amazing. You know, yeah, it is. Now the other seven, the other six wonders of the ancient world, apparently they're not around anymore. You know, but that one is still standing, and it was two thousand years older than any of the other six, and they're gone. So, you know, yeah. what's that saying? <laughs> you know, there's still ruins of the uh, 
hanging gardens, isn't there? There's, there's, I'm not sure. Not that it. I'm aware of. There might be something there, but it would be more like foundation stones, and that would be a guess because when they look at things on now under the tells and the mounds, they uncover something. They're still trying to figure out what it is and what it was used for. You know, mm -hmm. most of the time, they've they've got a good idea of where the the Tower of Babel was. And in fact, uh, what was his name? Uh, Saddam Hussein was trying to rebuild that tower. Mm. You know. That's right. Yeah, he was put pumping millions of dollars into that effort. Mm. So, because he reckoned he, he was a he reckoned he was a descendant of um, Nebuchadnezzar, didn't he? I think he was thinking of that, or he was wanting to be the second Nebuchadnezzar. Mm. You know, and stamp, yeah. stamping gold coins with his seal on them and things like that. Yes, I believe that's a, we can see that on the internet if we look for it. Yeah, the internet is becoming a very good library to consult almost anything instantaneously. Mm. So, uh, but again, you know, we're looking at a young. You know, archaeology is a very young science. Mm. Do you know much about the Hanging Gardens, or why? Because I don't know much about them. Why were Why were they a wonder? What was it about the gardens? Were they hanging upside down or something? The Hanging Gardens. Apparently, the the designs that I've seen of them, which I haven't looked into very much, were that the, the terrace. They were terraced, uh, one above the other, and then they would have trees and bushes, and then the vines that would hang down the walls, you know, and that was probably uh, watered by the river there. Mm. And they had to have pumps to pump the water up continually to keep the water flowing through the soils to keep the plants alive. But uh, that technology in itself was really amazing because if they could do that, you know, they could do pretty much anything we're doing now, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, you, could, you have to have a water supply, either that or a large, you know, a basin, you know, like a re reservoir. Mm. Um, but where are those other six wonders? They're not around. See, they're gone. Yeah. I mean, I don't see any hanging garden pictures on the Internet, you know. <laughs> I mean, the other depictions of someone's imagination. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, so you ask me what they look like. I don't know. See, all, the, all that we can do is just guess. Engineers and artists, they have imaginations, and that's what they base the, uh, their conjectures on. But apparently they were fabulous. And I'd heard that the wall around Babylon was so thick that you could have chariot races on the top of the wall. And the chariots could run, could, I think it was three chariots, could could easily side by side travel along with their horses. Wow! You know, and Nebuchadnezzar got the big head over that. You know, he <laughs> says, "Wow, look at this great city that I built." Well, that was just before he turned into an animal, a beast. Mm. Who you know took his reign away from him for a few years. Mm. Yeah. With the pharaohs, do you think they were, um, you know that gold picture we use on the immortality study? And uh, it shows that uh, you were using that gold picture as an illustration of how uh, elongated the heads were and how, because of the genetic mutations and stuff. Um, Chris's son Matthew came back from uh, Europe and they'd been to an exhibition at the Louvre about uh, Egyptian uh, ancient, uh -huh. ancient Egypt, and they was they would, had a tour guide, and they were saying, "Oh, they used to, you know, like they make their necks bigger or their ears, you know, when they're kids in Africa and things." Well, they said in Egypt they'd be stretching the kids' heads to make them elongated. So he was wow. basically, he's basically saying that it wasn't um, geneticness at all. It was they're just doing that to their own kids to make their heads elongated. But well, uh, yeah. I don't. See, uh, yeah, I understand that that. Um, might be possible to some extent, but not to that extreme. I don't think. You know, that was. Did you see the way those heads looked, and and the necks were really little. And then you have the uh, strange thing that's going on with uh, the hat that the pharaoh's wearing. 
you know, and the, and his wife Nefertiti is sitting there looking pretty uh, suspicious with that giant thing covering some kind of, you know, I don't I don't really buy that because the, the volume of the head, the volume was just not the same thing. Because if you distort a skull while it's somewhat soft, you still don't get more volume out of it, you know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You, you, all you'd really do is push it into a, a little small little bundle, but, you know, yeah. that thing, it just doesn't look right. And in the, I mean, I'm yeah. behind that. That's a, a great stab at a guess, but, you know, I think they were actually, there's actually been, and I listen to some strange things on the radio late at night occasionally, but uh, there was a, a gentleman who was talking about a discovery that was made of a, in, in Egypt of something that was over an archway that, that looked like a picture of, a, of an alien, as we understand aliens. Yeah. And they, they plastered over it so no one would see it because they were not wanting anybody to know that there would, there would have been aliens thousands of years ago, you know. And it was exactly like the depiction of the aliens that you see in these science fiction movies, you know, with the almond eyes, and, you know, and so the government, I suppose, just plastered over it. They didn't want, it, want this going on. But that might be because they were being compelled to by the, you know, the Nephilim or the people that are... See, Nephilim doesn't necessarily mean what people normally think. It doesn't mean a giant. A giant, that it, Nephilim means fallen ones. See, that's what it means in Hebrew. So the fallen ones were the messengers, and they were meddling with human genetics. You know, hmm. and uh, they still are, and continue. Ha they have continued to throughout time. Right now, the science of the that they're messing with in the you know the genetics of vegetation that we're trying to. We're trying to go to the grocery and we're trying to find food, and there's these uh, weird genetically modified objects that really uh, they have no seeds, you know. And uh, he he didn't give us food without seed in them, but we see these things today because they've been messed with, and the ge genetic material of other other animals and plants are being mixed together, and to make these really strange objects that we go to the grocery and see. Hmm. And, uh, so we've uh, we've crossed that line yeah. and they've messed with it to such an extent that the crops are actually contaminating the real crops that are real food. Hmm. You know. Yeah. It's having an effect on a lot of things and I don't know, the, the companies are not re being responsible that uh, they're doing this stuff. Well, when you think that maybe the technology was just as good back then as it is now, then you can easily believe that they were doing exactly what we're doing now, back then. Yes. Exactly. Tamp tampering with the genetics. and Yeah. And then there's this, uh, there's a verse. I'll read it uh, if I can get it up here. The, uh, speaking of the Great Pyramid, well, the, the fellow they call Josephus, or, you know, Josephus, was a writer, uh, a historian, that was uh, showing things that were happening at the time the temple was destroyed. And he talked about, in his book, about the, um, the structures in Egypt, you know. Mm -hmm. And the structures he referred to were uh, the, obviously, either the Sphinx or the pyramids, or all three. Uh, or, or, or both of them, he was talking about two things which would possibly be the Sphinx and the Three Pyramids. I was wondering, well, why did he say two things? You know, two structures that were built by the, by the descendants of, of Seth. That's, that's the phrase that he used. The descendants of Seth constructed two structures that are still in Egypt. And he was talking about it as if it happened before the flood. Now, the two objects even though there's four objects, he may have been referring to the three pyramids that were there as one of the structures, and the other being the Sphinx. Now that's interesting. 
but because I couldn't get two. I, I mean, because there's three pyramids, and there's one sphinx. So it must be that he was grouping the two together, you know, as two. I don't. But he talked about it. And then we've got Yeshayahu the prophet, uh, or Isaiah, in the in the book of Isaiah, chapter 19. In that day, an altar to Yahuwah shall be in the midst of the land of Mitzrayim, and a standing column to Yahuwah at its border. And it shall be a sign and for a witness to Yahuwah of hosts in the land of Mitzrayim. When they cry to Yahuwah because of the oppressors, he sends them a savior and an Elohim, and shall deliver them. And Yahuwah shall be known to Mitzrayim, and the Mizraites shall know Yahuwah in that day, and make slaughtering and meal offering, and shall make a vow to Yahuwah and pay it. Now that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So where, what would that possibly be? It might be that that's uh, referring to these way marks, you know, that the, that the descendants of Seth had constructed. But, you know, here's the thing. When I was, I was getting ready to say this earlier, but if I was going to build an engineer, a structure that was going to be the strongest possible structure, it would have to be made out of huge, huge blocks. And it would have to be in a shape that would be able to handle a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you study space technology, when they build things, they build them in sh shapes of threes. The geodesic dome is a very strong structure, and it's a bunch of triangles. So the triangle is a very, very strong structure. And if you were going to build a, a, a structure, what would be the real reason that you'd build it, a thing that size? It would probably be for protection. So it had to have been a fortress, much more so than a place to bury someone. You know, I never really got it. I never saw the the pyramids as tombs, even though that seems to be the promoted idea. The people were promoting that they're, oh, those are tombs for pharaohs. But, and there's the king's chamber, and there's the queen's chamber. Well, it just didn't really make sense. Like, yeah, we have to keep these robbers out. Well, the best way to keep robbers out is to bury it so that no one finds it, rather than lay it out there in the open. You know? <laughs> but, uh, it's a giant puzzle box, you know. Mm. But uh, do you think around the time of Moshe and after that it could have been used for tombs, but prior to the flood it, it might have had a different purpose, like you were saying about a fortress and things. Maybe they're finding people in there and and dating it further back than what it really is. Maybe that was a, a later use for the pyramids, but prior to that they were mm -hmm. fortresses for... Wouldn't it make more sense? Mm. Uh, now, they could have had some serious technology in terms of, um, you know, we had bullets and bombs and missiles and things like that. And it could be that this thing was built as a bomb shelter. Mm. Yeah. And, uh, it, and then the flood happened. And, of course, all the, you know, evidence of what happened before was wiped away. And they found things in odd places of the earth. I mean, old pyramids that are underwater and, you know, like in the Yucatan Peninsula area, the Gulf of Mexico, there's a pyramid that's a step pyramid that's underwater, you know, it looks similar to the Mayan pyramids, you know. And they did use those as altars at the top. Mm. You know, the Mayans had these long stairways that go up, and then the Mayan priests would have an altar up at the top where he would sacrifice human lives and take their beating hearts out of their bodies. You know, that was a, a, real, a real use of a pyramid at that time. Hmm. And, uh, but, the, but the pyramid at Giza, the Great Pyramid and the other two smaller ones, they seem to be older, than much, much older. Hmm. And uh, the, uh, you know, the other structures of man are all dissolving. But they, they're still here. And it may be that, you know, Isaiah or Yeshiyahu 19 is describing these. Mm. It really goes against our perception of scriptural times, doesn't it? Because we all imagine them just sitting around in tents, staring at sheep, uh, <laughs> you know. And here they are, here they are with, you know, yeah. technology that we've got today, building pyramids, fighting 
possibly giants, uh, yeah. with who knows what sort of weapons. It just goes against everything we're taught at Sunday school. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. Why? Yeah, it must have been a fortress of some sort. Uh, it had, like you say, a, it may have had a later use, but no one really can can say that they, uh, uh, no one ever read a document that explained what that thing was. And, and uh, you know, the books of Enoch, I guess we could study and look for clues in there because they had to have been written before the flood, you know, because Enoch lived before the flood. And, uh, if anything came through about it, that would be great. But, uh, you know, there's mysteries that we can't answer. All we can do is just guess about them. But they're not salvational issues anyway. But if somebody did build that before, after the flood, then there would certainly be some sort of a huge nation that had been there that had done such a thing. But the Egyptians didn't, you know, there's no pictures. Uh, like the, in, in some of the tombs and structures that are in Egypt uh, that were built thousands of years ago, 3,000 years ago, the um, insides have all sorts of ornate pictures mm. that are in wonderful condition. And the, these three pyramids don't have any pictures of any kind inside them. So they weren't done, they weren't at all the same things. Of course, I've forgotten more about those pyramids than I've read books about them. I used to study pyramidology, you know, the, uh, the not that that's a, that's just a study of pyramids is all it is, and the origins of them. And none of the authors of any of those books knew where they really started, who built them or why, you know. All they could do is guess what their use was. And most of them uh, surmised that they were, you know, some sort of a burial chamber, you know. But, you know, it's interesting, uh, this coming seminar, I think it's this weekend, uh, we're going to have, in, well, after the Sabbath is the first day of the week, and we're planning on having a seminar on death. Mm -hmm. and, uh, death is a, a subject that's much like the pyramids. There's not a lot of, well, all we've got is the evidence of the pyramid, but we don't have any idea what it, what it was for or what, who did it. But death is even worse than that. There's no one that we can say, uh, well, you've been dead. Let me interview you about this and get all the facts. Yeah. <laughs> you know, even when uh, Yahushua raised Lazarus, that we know his name is Elazar, uh, he was unaware of what happened. He didn't have anything to say about it. He had lots of words, you know, when he wrote the book of John. He didn't have any, uh, I mean, that's the same fellow. A lot of people don't know that John is the, fellow that we call Lazarus, if you just look in the book, you'll say, wait a minute, there's nobody named John writing this. But there is a fellow that's named the disciple whom Yahushua loved. And look, he, he's the only one talking about Lazarus. And look, he's the one that had that title. You know, it's just odd. But he never really said, you know, when I, when I first w went out, the, I got sick and I died and then I saw the light and then I went to the light. <laughs> you know, as we hear people saying, yeah. there's no explanation, you know. Mm. But uh, you know, he was just asleep. It was like he was I mean, he was dead, but it was like he was asleep, mm. and he woke up. You know, yes. just that's all it's going to be like. I mean, when Alexander the Great wakes up from his death, and Daniel and and uh, you know Mark and me and all our wives and children, if if we happen to, if Yahushua tarries, none of us will say, well, I can't really tell you how long I was asleep. No. You know, there's not going to be any of that. Time doesn't pass. No. I mean, it passes, but it's not like it's passing and we're just sitting there going, come on, <laughs> wake up, you know. <laughs> Getting bored <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, you know. Mm. Uh, I don't know. There's just so many things not to know, you know. Yeah, totally. So I don't really have much to. I mean, I do have a. I have a lot to say, yeah. but I, I'm not going to have. Death is not a subject that anybody can say. Well, I've studied this for 30 years, and I can tell you all about it. Well, you can study it for 30 minutes and have no no less information, yeah. you know. I mean, than somebody that studied for 30 years. I mean, real information, you know, yeah. and. Uh, it's going to be a fun thing, but uh, 
the, anyway, in the study of pyramidology, and of course they always glance over immediately to the fact that, yes, the uh, desert over there was very uh, ideal conditions for preserving mummies, and, you know, it was dry, so the lack of moisture allowed more material, to biological material to come through. Mm -hmm. And inside these uh, burial chambers, you'll find all these boats and food and chairs and all the jewels and treasures. But you know what? The, the dead guy in the middle of the room, he never got up and used any of those things. <laughs> didn't even get up and sit in the chair. And he certainly didn't get in the boat and go anywhere. You know, so we know that the dead you know, are not going to be able to use anything in the world ever again. No. You know. In that uh, gold picture with the, you know, Queen Nefertiti and the elongated pharaohs, and they were much bigger than the, the people that were worshipping them, uh, were they the pharaohs? Do you think some of the pharaohs were uh, giants or giants. formed people? Hmm. Well, you know, that's possible because there's, a, there's several other stone reliefs that you'll see that have depictions of the king standing there and small people walking up to him to offer him things. And there's, a, in one of the pictures I remember, there was a, an image of the sun deity, which we would also associate with the image of the beast, uh, and it had that little nasd out star shape, and it was in the picture, in a circle around it, and, and then, then a little structure that looked a little bit like a Christmas tree, mm -hmm. right below, with little fun little ornaments and things on it. More stick-like, though, but still, it kind of reminded you of it. And uh, he was a giant sitting in this giant chair. It was a huge chair. And then, of course, the that is a possibility, you know, that these kings were huge. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the polydactyl attribute where you have six fingers, you know, you have an extra little finger or something, that would often be uh, something that would be a reason why a person would be made king. And of course that would also likely be a sign that some genetic tampering had happened. Not yeah. so much mutation. You know, mutation is one thing, but in most cases it would be more likely that you'd be lacking something if something was a mutant rather than adding something. So that extra finger must be a trait that is an echo from some sort of genetic tampering, mm. you know. Anyway, they would be made king too. Uh, the six-fingered man, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, everybody would talk about that in the, in the house, and then that would leave, and the family would talk about it. He has six fingers. And then then the neighborhood would find out, you know, that's the house where a little child that's growing up has six fingers. And then, of course, the six-fingered person would be the political leader when he became an adult. Everybody knows him. You've got six fingers. Yeah. I can't help but vote for you. Or if they voted at all, I mean, you know, the six-fingered guy would be the, he's in the room eating with the boss, you know, you know because he'd be important, you know. Yeah. Not that he would know anymore, but he would have six fingers. Yeah. And that, that conversation piece would elevate a person up in any society. Mm. But uh, yeah. I don't, I'm just guessing, but I would expect that. You know. mm. um, of course, if, if you had two heads, you'd be the same kind of guy. You know? um, I don't know. It's just there are things like that in the world. You know, two, a snake. Uh, with two heads, or a person with two heads. It makes talking to yourself a different thing altogether. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. And I've admitted to the, uh, the fact that I have talked to myself. In fact, I do it. Still, you know. <laughs> but uh, I guess that's the two hemispheres of the brain. You know? they, uh, they used to call me David Healthcott. <laughs> uh oh. Well, now tell me about that. I don't know about that. David Healthcott, you know that famous piano player that's nuts and used to talk to himself. They made a movie about him. They made a movie about him, Shine. Yeah. It was called Shine. And they used to call me David Healthcott. Back well, I have to look that movie up. I haven't seen it. <laughs> it's called Shine. Yeah. Okay. He must have been an Australian guy, famous 
piano player and he used to mumble to himself and he was he was nuts. Wow. So when I first started working in the salon and I was talking to myself and uh, uh, grumbling <laughs> and all this stuff, they used to call me, hey, David. <laughs> so, yeah. So do you, do you think, uh, have you looked into much of Egypt around the time of Moshe? Do you think when people say that Tutankhamun was the... Uh, Ramses or the Pharaoh's son because he got knocked off, you know, the Pharaoh went out to kill Israel and he got drowned in the the Red Sea and so he, they had a, a temple waiting for him and the, it must be Tutankhamun, that was the Pharaoh's son that died in the uh, in the last plague. All the things they say about that, do you tend to go along with those sort of things that they say? Well, that, that, that sounds uh, like it's trying to twist what scripture is saying, you know, and I don't think there's any record in the secular record of that ever happening. And there's all sorts of imaginative people that are writing books. They're saying things that Moshe was a Pharaoh, you know, there's books about that. And that Husha was a Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. And have you, have you heard those rumors? No, I know that one. Yeah, there's people who believe it. If it gets in print, and it, and it sounds at all plausible, maybe not true, then people will fall for that and go, yeah, yeah. that makes sense. And Joseph was a pharaoh. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. Well, I don't think that we can say that Moshe, was, or the son of Pharaoh that died in the plague, was drowned. No, he, he died of an illness that happened that night to all the male animals that were first, I mean, all the uh, all the firstborn uh, male animals, you know, yeah. and people, you know. Yeah. But, uh, uh, they were, don't, they say were, that, don't they say that the son died at the plague and that because the Pharaoh went out and he was drowned chasing after the Israelites? Oh, the yes, son, the Pharaoh was drowned. Okay, yeah, I see. the Pharaoh was drowned. And so... I, I heard that they they used to say they they prepare the pyramid for a pharaoh the minute they became a pharaoh, so you know this pharaoh I forget now something about the fact that the pharaoh died, so his son why why was there such a small pharaoh in a tomb, and uh, Tutankhamun was a pharaoh like a child you know they were saying why was he buried in a tomb like that, and they're saying well those that were trying to the scriptures were saying, well, because the Pharaoh went out and was drowned, and so his son, who wouldn't have had time to have a pyramid made for him, because he was still a child, the child was buried in the tomb of his father because his father never came back. Oh. Things like that, you know. No, I don't believe that. Uh, <laughs> that that's, not, that's just made up. It's being fabricated right there in people's imaginations. Yeah. Uh, and, People write books, and there's endless supplies of pyramid books and oh. ideas that have bandied around. But uh, you know, and we may not have touched on the real truth at all in any of those things. But uh, mm. I don't really believe that. Still to this day, that the pyramids, the original ones, were built as tombs. Mm. You know, the others may have been the small ones that are crumbling, but you know. Anyway, the, uh, <clears throat> the, you know, when Moshe was there and Aaron, Aharon, uh, they were, they were seeing the end of the Egyptian power because all of the, the mightiest army on the, on the planet and all of their military equipment and all of their men and chariots were all completely taken out in one fell swoop. I mean, at one time. And the Pharaoh along, along with it. If, if the Pharaoh had not died in that, in that uh, you know, sea of reeds, uh, when the water came back and covered over them, then uh, there would be some record of that fact, you know. I mean, he would have said, okay, and then there would be some, he'd be on the other side of the bank and and it was, it, they would have said that when the when the ladies were dancing and playing their tambourines and singing the song, mm. uh, you know. I think they described that the Pharaoh died, you mm. know. 
And if they, and if it isn't clear, then, and we had to suspect that he was still alive, then surely somewhere there would be a sentence that said, and the Pharaoh returned back to his uh, pummeled kingdom with his tail between his legs. It doesn't yeah. say that. No. You know? no. I mean, he was, he was done for. Yeah. That was the end of it. Yeah. Um, it's amazing to me just how much black magic and sorcery there was in the Pharaoh's kingdom. I mean, the fact that Aaron threw his rod on the ground and it turned into a snake, and they all just went, oh, so what? You know, and the magicians came out and did the same thing. We don't see too many magicians these days turning a rod into a snake, do you? So No, you know. Maybe in the higher levels of black magic, but not in... Well, yeah. Not well, in you know, that's just it. In that witchcraft seminar, I do discuss the fact that even... Uh, the Reagan administration was using, and they during World War II, the Germans were using it, the British, British were using it, and they were actually consulting, you know, psychics and mm. mentalists, you know. Mm. So they were actually trying to contact the spirit world, and uh, conducting Star Wars. I mentioned that. So, I mean, not the kind of Star Wars that you know, we're talking about today, but, you know, astrology, you know. Mm. <clears throat> so we've got that uh, in, in government, and of course if they're doing it today, um, we aren't hearing about it. I'm not hearing a lot about, you know, the President of the United States or other world leaders and what they're consulting. They don't let us know a lot of things. They, they kind of keep things to themselves. They hold things close. They don't let out a lot of information what's going on, you know, if they're meeting, you know, with people under Area 51 or whatever, I don't know, you know, if there's you know, fallen Malachim and so forth living there, uh, which brings up a subject, you know, we've had a, a terrible time here in the United States with uh, people crossing the borders of our country from Canada and, New Mex and Mexico and just walking through them like there's no problem. There's line, there's camera footage where people can have recorded just long lines of, of people going through the border with backpacks loaded with drugs and, and, and you know contraband and weapons and all sorts of things coming into our country in the United States but they can protect the, the boundaries of area 51 but they can't seem to protect the boundaries of the, of the nation if they wanted, if there was a will to do it, they would, you know. Yeah. But it's so bizarre. <laughs> so. It's amazing that Area 51, you go on YouTube and look at things and people just go, you know, joyriding around in their Jeeps and they get, you know, shot at. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. Arrested. Yeah, they're in the kills. Yeah. And they're not even close yet. They're like, you know, kilometers. Not even close. Like, no. Amazing. And believe me, uh, the military that protects the Area 51 and other bases and embassies, they will kill you, and they won't have any qualms about it. When I was stationed <clears throat> during the Vietnam theater, uh, I was stationed in Okinawa, and then I would go to Korea, you know, back and forth occasionally for a few weeks, you know, and while I was there, we had a curfew every every night, and at a certain time every night, I don't remember exactly what the time was, but you had to be on post, or you had to be on base, or the Air Force base. Uh, and if you weren't on base, you had to be off base inside of a building, and you could not be out on a street. And there was a boy, a young boy, he was probably 19 or 20, about my age, and he was someone that... Uh, was there with us, uh, United States Air Force personnel. How old and he was you back then? Um, I was uh, 20, 21, 22, mm. actually. Mo oh, 20, 21 at that time. Mm. I don't know which, which it was, but it seemed like I was 21 when that happened because I wasn't too far away from getting out. But I, was, I got out when I was a little after 22. But um, <clears throat> this boy was coming back onto the base I don't know if it was 10 p.m. at night, and he was stumbling, not stumbling, but walking up to the 
base um, entrance, the gate. And the MPs were given orders that if anyone was moving out in the distance, they were to be shot on sight. And he came up in his civilian clothes, of course, and he was coming back onto the base, and he didn't know. He probably just didn't have all the information. But they shot him dead. Hmm. You know, and he was one of us. Wow. And that's, uh, that, th this stuff is really serious. So if you're out in Area 51, and you're wandering around in a vehicle or on foot, anywhere near it, even if you're not across the line, don't take the risk, because they'll kill you. Hmm. Those signs posted really mean it. In fact, if you see the sign, you could still be in trouble, you know. On you know, just just get away from it. You know, yeah. the, the people do mess with it though, and they think that they won't do anything, but they will. Oh, they put lots of books out from people that have managed to retire or get away from there, and they were staff or they were scientists underground, or and they they tell stories about it, don't they? Oh yeah, yeah. I, uh, I find the information on the internet really interesting too. The pictures of the aerial photography around the Area 51 area. Mm. And there's something really uh, secret there, you know. Mm. But uh, and the stuff is, uh, is going on, for the most part, underground, yeah. you know, with all those big drills that they have. In fact, it wasn't uh, too long ago, a couple of years ago, Phyllis and I were driving along on one of the expressways. And over on the overpass of one of the expressways, we saw this enormous cylindrical object, and it was enormous. The uh, trailer that it was on had wheels that it had wheels all along the trailer. It was an enormous trailer. It was bigger than normal. It had wheels not at the front and back, but it was wheels continuously. You know, like uh, centipede wheels, you know. <laughs> and uh, the truck that was pulling it was huge. And the thing that was on it was uncovered. It was one of these drills, you know, oh, underground things that will go through rock. Mm. And, yeah, and they're manned, as I understand it. The, 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 the drill has got a, a team of people that are inside of it. It's like a missile, only it goes real slow through solid rock. And it drills corridors and tunnels, and that's what uh, this thing was. Hmm. It was a really, really alien, uh, to use a strange word, bizarre piece of equipment, technology that, you know, you don't see every day. Yeah. It's really interesting. And I'm a kind of a science buff, and I've always been into it. I mean, for many, many years, I just studied science only. And, you know, cosmology and biology and all those things. And uh, archaeology. But then, you know, and I figured, uh, after a while, I figured, wow, these people really don't know what they're doing. You know, at least the, the material that I was reading. You know, and they said, that, yeah, well, we act like, we, they know, they know stuff, some things, but all of the stuff that they're venturing into are just guesses. So I just got kind of tired of it. I wanted the truth. So <clears throat> immediately, I, my wife had arranged for me to have a copy of the scriptures. And I remember distinctly the day that it happened. It was, I just saw the scriptures. And I realized that this was the scriptures, the word of Yahuwah. I didn't know his name. But I, I saw something laying on top of it. And, I, and, I, and my, inside my heart, I was going, even though I'd never read a word of it, I knew that it was Yahuwah's word. And I saw this other book sitting on top of it, and I felt this in my heart. It was like something was in me, like I was possessed. A rage burned inside of me. And I looked at that, and I said, nothing can be on top of this book. You know, and I went, what's that about? You know, and I picked the object up that was on top of it, and I lifted the book up, and I opened it to the very center, and there it was, Yeshayahu, chapter 53. And it was, it was on the right side of the book page, and I was reading that, and I freaked out. I was going, what? You know, I know this person. And I had never, I had never read this book, anything in that book. 
All I had heard were sound bites, you know, here and there, you know, long, you know, were, had no real relationship with each other. And I read this entire chapter and it traumatized me. And I closed it and I said, I've got to read every word of this, you know. And it was so exciting. It felt like life was flying into me. And so that was when I opened it up to the first page, same, that same few moments, minutes, and I read the preface because I, I had committed myself. I, I had vowed to read every, every word. And I read the preface and something like one or two paragraphs down, it discussed the name. And they had they said, well, in regard to the divine name, Y-H-W-H, the translators adopted the device of rendering that term as L-O-R-D in all capital letters. Then again, I got raged, enraged. I was inside of me. I didn't know what it was. I was going, what's going on? You know, and I went, that's wrong. <laughs> These people are wrong too the people that wrote the preface. But I knew that they had meddled with the text. And so what I did was I went to the library at U of L, University of Louisville, where I had gone to school. I had already graduated long, long before, some eight years or nine years before that. And I went to the library and I researched and went to the photocopier and I got all these books and about the alphabet of the Hebrew language. And I re realized there was these letters, I've got to learn these, find out what these are. And then I, that was the beginning for me, mm. you know, the very beginning. And then uh, all this material just started flowing towards me, you know, from that library. And of course, this was before the internet was ever anything, you know. It was uh, like, uh, well, I guess 1984 or 83, you know. And so then I started to attend this Christian organization that was, you know, handy and uh, knowing the name, you know, and I was there for at least a year. And I, and I was knowing the name, though, I was hearing the, the teachings, and it was just really hard for me to not just jump up and go, can we use his real name? So he worked did. out. So he worked out his real name. Yeah. When we would sing the songs, we would put the name in, the right name, you know, yeah. and we'd just say, well, that's not the real name. This is the real name. And my Phyll Phyllis and I were standing next to each other singing along with it, you know, but we were singing your real name. What name had you worked out back then? Well, Yahuwah, or I think at that time it was, uh, well, it was Yahweh. 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 At that time. It's still close. And because I didn't know about the letter W. Actually, it was a U, and they, um, and then I was calling the Messiah Yeshua, yeah. you know, because that's what I was able to understand in my beginning area of uh, knowledge, you know, just find stumbling around with the Hebrew and trying to make sense of it. But uh, later on, of course, I was able to enunciate more clearly what I was reading in the Hebrew, you know, mm -hmm. as the accuracy came to me but um, that that is so amazing and then the name knowing his name I was uh, at some point I had a study group that I had gathered together where several young men would study with us at uh, the school where my son attended which was called Christian Academy and we were there on uh, uh, what we understood as the seventh day of the week, but we didn't know that was the Sabbath. We were, it was late in the afternoon and we all got together and we were reading the scriptures and reading the commandments. And then it dawned on all of us as we were reading and studying that the day that we were in was the Sabbath. And we went, wow, this is it. It's not the first day of the week. And we just got that from reading the word, you know, so we were reading it right out of the word and Yahuwah was programming us, what he was doing was he was show, giving us his name and then giving us his covenant sign. Yes. And those two were the, are the critical thing to overcome for the first person that comes out of Christianity. 
you know, and he won't give you one without the other, you know. <laughs> His name will not be important to you if you won't obey him. Yes. And then again, he won't let you obey him, really. He won't, he won't give you the heart to obey him unless you acknowledge his name, mm. you know. Wonderful. It is. Mm. And it was so exciting to read that. In fact, I remember the day very distinctly. It was a beautiful day. It was a fine temperature. It wasn't hot. It wasn't cold. But we would not drive home. I would not start the car because the text that we were reading had to do with, I think it was Exodus chapter 16. And it said, it was talking about all these things that were to be done and not done on the Sabbath. And we could not leave or go out of our vicinity on the Sabbath. And we couldn't start a fire on the Sabbath. And I went, well, see, I knew that an internal combustion engine involved fire. <laughs> you just don't see it. Mm -hmm. And so I can't initiate the fire. So I don't start fires on the Sabbath either. When we light the candles, we do it before the Sabbath. You know. You do that every week? Most every week. Some weeks it sneaks up on us. Not that the Sabbath sneaks up on us, but we forget to light them. Let me, let me go see if they lit them. Yeah. Hey, did you guys light the candles? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they did it. They did it. What, it was, uh, sometimes we'll light the whole menorah, but sometimes we'll just light a, a, a candle. And the candle that we light, we can extend that fire from there to any other candle once we've started the fire. <laughs> Clever. So initiating the fire, you're okay as long as it's, you know. That, that's just one of the th little things we do. Why do you light candles on the Sabbath? Well, we don't have to, but we do because we like to, like, well, it's something that we started with training the children in the way that they should go, yeah. and now my son Adam is a man, and he still lights it, you know, yeah. he just lights it, and we, we would light the, the menorah, and we still do light the menorah, you know, um, and we usually start with one candle, and then we extend it to the rest of the candles, you know, mm. so... I guess that's why the the uh, Yahudim do the same thing with one candle. They have a, a shamash candle, the the, the the servant candle, and then they light the other candles with it as the days go by. We had, anyway, we had a candle lit. We just didn't have all. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. There you go. Oh wow. Anyway, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Now, is it still Sabbath there? Yes, it is. Wow. What's it look like with the, the menorah with the uh, hanging gardens of Babylon? Oh, it's going to look amazing. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Wow. Anyway. Stunning. Yeah. You see? It's a nice little menorah. They're real. Yeah. If anybody thinks this is a fake picture, they can just look at the angles of the light on my face. <laughs> yeah. Hope I don't catch my hair on fire. Anyway, this is a, a wonderful thing to, to be able to do this on Sabbath. Mm. It's fun for me. Yeah. And I'm awake, you know. Yeah. Of course, I was pretty sleepy all day today. Yeah. I didn't drink as much coffee today because, see, I was running errands with Phyllis and doing mm. things. Yeah. Did you get all my emails today? Yes, I got them. I read them not long uh, before I called you. That was okay. a, a good one from the... Uh, of the uh, summation about the ISR and everything about the oh the, yeah okay. yeah I'd like to just keep that in constant prayer among all the auxiliary st staff of Tor Institute and just keep everybody on the same page and if everybody at ISR does the same thing that would be great mm. and then uh, maybe something will change you know because we can't really do any more than pray you know. Yeah. It's sad that um, people feel they have to cut other people down to promote their own thing, whereas if we all worked as brothers and sisters, we'd all be walking hand in hand, like, yeah, well, give, give me a copy of that and I'll, I'll help you. I'll, 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 you know, you know I'll um, 
stock it. I'll publish it. I'll stock help it. You. Make it available. Get yeah. it distributed. Disseminate yeah. it to the world. Yeah, and yet they, they, they go about it the wrong way. Well, I don't know. I don't understand everything that people think. But, uh, yeah. You know, I guess there's, uh, you know, when there's doctrinal differences, they can uh, cause division. Yeah. And uh, I accept people that have really weird ideas. It's the ideas I make fun of that I, uh, I, I participate in the uh, anthropomorphic illustration of the idea. I'm not saying that, you know, like I was saying in that one seminar, that the people themselves are not depicted as wolfmen. No. It's, it's doctrine. You know, it's the teaching itself. That's what it is. That was a little you know? fun. That was fun, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> But people are easily offended and they misunderstand. And they always have. Uh, really, I was getting all kinds of, uh, when I first put out my first copy of Fossilized Customs, I had all these angry people writing me letters going, you know, you're saying this about me and I'm not. You know, it's not about a person. Mm -hmm. You know, the person that uh, originated the idea might have a problem, maybe. But, you know, Constantine might... I might be able to, he might be able to, I am talking about Constantine, yeah. But the, he's just the origin of it. But the, the, the spirit behind those kinds of people, though, is the dragon, you know. That's what Scripture says, gives the beast his power. So the men themselves are, are being used, you know. They don't really, that's, I mean, if they had all the facts, possibly they wouldn't be doing what they did. But they I mean, or have done what they did. Dragon hates the covenant, doesn't he? Yes, the marriage. That's what the covenant is. He hates the marriage, and he hates all marriage. Yes. And he seeks to divide mm. our house. And the house of Yahuwah is, I think, the, as the scripture says, the very first place that Yahuwah is going to start with to judge. And what better way to judge his house? than to judge the hearts of his people among one another. When he told us to love one another, and we failed at that, even though it's so simple, even though we might have differences, because we're all going to be at different places in the race. You know, We're not on the same page, but that's because we're not following Yahushua directly. We're following the teachings of men, which he said was always the problem. Yeah. You know, People stand up and say something really outlandish, and then they say, well, you know, that makes sense. I'm with you. And then other people go, oh, well, that's where the crowd is. Let's go over there. And then, uh, you know, and that's how Christianity started up uh, uh, getting so, you know, big. Because people were saying, well, it must be true. I mean, all these people can't be wrong. There's 300 million of them or a billion of them. You know, how could they all be wrong? You know? So all these little you know, one of the things that I read from Brother Chris, he said that his experience was he was told by one of the denominational leaders that if you don't have a covering of a, an organizational covering, I guess that's what he meant, the Nicolaitan, yeah. uh, then you're not covered and therefore you can't just be out there on your own. And I agree that you must be in a, a fellowship. In, in, in community, community is a very important aspect of it, but we aren't supposed to look at one another at any point, you know. Mm. We're supposed to look to Yahushua and what he said, you know. And if he says love one another, and the guy's doing things that is in your assembly that are obviously direct personal violations, and you go to the person and you say, you are personally violating this commandment then we can go to him privately and say that, you know, and even if it's a leader or a teacher. And we can say, okay, this is the Torah command, and this is what you are actually practicing, you know. Oh, by the way, those accusers, it, where am I at? Uh, it's Sabbath. I'm not at the store, and neither are you. See, we're not there. No. See, so if they say we are, you know, it's just wrong, you know. Yeah. Anyway, that, anyway, those sorts of things need to be handled privately. And then if they will not hear, then we're to take it to the assembly after we've brought two or three others and they've refused. Then we can just say, well, you're just a, a 
a regular outsider. We're not going to say any more. Mm -hmm. But we don't mistreat them and throw stones at them or verbally libel or slander them because they're, they continue. He just said, forget it. Yeah. You know, it's over. You know, they're outsiders. Out of the thousands and thousands of um, uh, attacks and apparent chastisement you get, how many of them people actually knock on your door and say, brother, could I sit down and actually chat with you about something? No. Yeah. I had one lady come in, a, 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 a nice lady came into the, sh the shop, and she had this really stern look on her face, angry looking appearance and countenance, walked up to me and said, I just came in here to see if it was true. And I said, what? What? You came in to see if what was true? If all of this was true. And then she said, I see that it is. And she looked over and she saw a skull. <laughs> and she said, there's a skull. And I said, yeah. And it's not a real skull, though, is it? <laughs> and I said, who is it that created the skull? Do you know? Yeah. And she went, yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> what's wrong with a skull? You yeah. know, and it's not a real skull. It's just a skull. And, you know, it's like, well, Satan has used those. Well, <laughs> I'm not using it, you know. But, you know, see, the, uh, the thing of it is that it's just looking outside the body and looking for evil. You can't find it. It's not outside the body. See, evil is not anywhere except in men's hearts. Hmm. And, of course, the spiritual evil of, of our, because uh, we wrestle against not flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers that are in the heavenlies, which means that they're, they're spiritual. And that's the real enemy, you know, the enemy. But we wrestle against the enemy, you know. But what we're actually doing with our hands and our mouth and our eyes, you know, those are the things, you know, that matter. Hmm. You know, if we turn our foot from doing what we want to do on the Sabbath and call his Sabbath a delight, Wow, isn't that Yeshayahu 58? I'm not sure. That's that's a good thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's the only one person that I remember coming in. Yeah. That I can remember. Yeah. And she did not tell me her name. I had no idea what who she was. Mm. Yeah. yeah. We got an email a few weeks ago from somebody who'd been in the shop. Um, but they, these people weren't even believers. They were people who just loved your shop and they were, right. they were sending out an email to to drum up support for your shop and they'd been in there and um, it was good because we hadn't really seen much inside it and you were standing there with these big eyes and, and a little card with the eyes and you were, oh yeah have we have fun there. have you seen that it's like a little, it's like a yeah it's like a little puppet where it's the counter area is like a little puppet show mm. because uh, the customers like us to do little funny little things and that's what that's all about. And uh, that one caller was not put up to it at all. That was a real call that I got in uh, for some lady that was actually talking about having used illegal drugs. You know, she might as well be calling a, a bank or something and saying, "I, uh, I did something really bad. Can you help me?" <laughs> but you know, it's like uh, I'm not doing it. You know, I'm talking to someone, but did you see the little masks that I was holding? Yeah. I put the mat, the phone up to the mask. Yeah, and uh, I bought a, a few Halloween masks, hmm. and uh, I'm sorry I didn't buy those, but Bob bought them, and they're there. I picked I picked a couple of them up, and I had it, the phone talking to that. I think the beaver was there too. We have a fun little beaver that's sitting on the counter. Yeah. And uh, people want to keep buying. They want to buy the beaver, yeah. but we won't sell them the beaver. Yeah. They love that little beaver. I put mustaches on it, you know, yeah. things like that. But it's just a fun little, you know, little scene, you know. I mean, I'm sorry that I, I have to be there at, at all, because if I didn't have to pay all the bills that I have to pay, and the income that I get from that store I use on the ministry, you know, because I have to support a huge building. And uh, 
people do help with that. You know, they help support it because one person can't. You know, it's just too you know, too enormous. Mm. You know, mm. I mean the the electricity and 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 gas and water yeah. by itself is bigger than most anybody would imagine. You know, you're still trying to sell that building, aren't you? Well, only because the the fact that it's such a burden, and we were thinking of moving into something very small, mm. something very 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 small that's already built, and then. Um, but that may not be who as well, and that's fine. Uh, but uh, for now, it is a, a wonderful thing to have the use of. And but the taxes on it are really high too. You know, we like to get time. See, if you own something in this country, you have to pay tax on it every year, and the tax is getting more and more. And I'm seeing it climbing. And I'm going, wait a minute, this is getting huge. And it's, it, it was already huge, but then it just jumped up about 25% in about three years. And that's just in the last three years, or four years. And so it's really becoming almost like a penalty for owning something. So I would rather not own something, you know. It's, it, the corporation owns it, you know, but that's, I mean, I really don't personally own the building. It's a the, uh, the corporation that we formed to kind of protect us from the government, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, and it also makes it nice, too, if one of us dies, then there's not a death tax and we have to sell it and give it all to the government. Mm -hmm. See, and that's another reason that we have a corporation. It isn't because we're evil. It's because by having a corporation, the corporation doesn't die. Mm -hmm. See, I can die, and Phyllis can die, and Adam can die. See, that's the board of directors hmm. right now uh, at the building that we have our Torah Institute at. Yeah. But uh, if one of the three of us dies, or two of the three of us die, then the, then the corporation doesn't die, see? It hmm. stays there. And someone else will come in and direct it, you know. Hmm. Maybe you. You never know. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If... Uh, if, uh, let's say, the George Soros or um, one of these really, really fantastically rich billionaires watches one of the YouTubes that we've put up and then goes, wait a minute, these people, they're, they need to, to get some help. And then they give us enough funding, then you could come here with your family and we could all be together, mm. you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can come here. <laughs> or we could come there. That would be fine with me. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'd love that. You know, it would be less radioactivity. Because, yeah. uh, you know, these there's so many. Look at the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. The, nor the Northern Hemisphere is loaded with all of these nuclear reactors. Yeah. And it's only going to get worse. Mm. And they're spewing it out all the time, you know. It sounds like it's, it's getting worse in Australia, but it doesn't sound like it's half as bad as the economy and the set up that you've got in America it, um, yeah. with, the, yeah. with the health care and the, and the taxes. It doesn't seem to be that bad down here. No. Uh, well, if you were to look at the global picture and then trace it back, it would probably be the, the demise of the economic circumstances is probably caused by the United States. Because if the United States gets a cough, then the rest of the world has the flu. I mean, that's just an old saying. But here's the thing. If you were to go back in time and try to track the one event where the water in the bathtub, someone pulled the plug and the water slowly drained out, some 15 years ago, I may be off by a year or two, there was a document that was signed that caused the North American Free Trade Agreement to go into effect. And that meant that all the businesses that were here, the textile industries, the steel industries, um, all the mercantile, you know, huge firms were uh, vulnerable because the fact is everything was a level playing field suddenly. And that me meant that they were going to be taxed at the highest rate of the, in the world. And they could conduct their business 
elsewhere in another place in the world. So slowly but surely, over the years, businesses and industries all left this country. And we were left with nothing but mostly white-collar paper pushers that just sort of swirled around a bunch of paper. We weren't producing anything. We were producing and then we weren't. And it was the North American Free Trade Agreement. And I don't want to slander the person that signed it, but he happened to be the president at the time. I think he was in the office two or three days at the end of his term, and then he signed that. And then the rest of the time, the water was draining out of the bathtub. And then that's what caused it. And then the whole world is now in that quagmire. But even if someone came in and said, well, let's go back and repair that, it would take 30 to 40 years to refill that bathtub. So in my lifetime, certainly, and possibly even my children, my, my two sons, they may not, not see what we had in the mid-1990s. Was that Bush Back or Clinton? It was actually George. It was uh, Bill Clinton, to be honest with you. Yeah, he signed it. But uh, <clears throat> it was a mistake, a business mistake, and it shouldn't have been done. But that was the pulling of the plug out of the bottom of the bathtub. And it took a long time for the water to go out. But the water that was leaving was the industry and the manufacturing and the producers. See, you, in economics, you've got two sides. You've got producers and you've got consumers. Or, you know, I don't want to get off on that subject, but, you know, in general, that's what it is. And if you mess with or tinker with the producers, then that's where you, your, your problem really is going to start. Mm. If you let them go, and let and just tax the consumption side, mm. and you're fine. Government can survive off of that, but it's not. It's tinkering with both sides, you know. And they did that. See, that's what they were tinkering with when they signed the NAFTA. They were messing with the production. Yeah. So we don't have steel anymore. This country has the fabulous natural resources, mm. and now they're attacking the energy sector. And that's kind of really, it's already really frying our, our economy. And it's affecting the whole world, too. Mm. But uh, we don't have leaders right now that are very uh, knowledgeable about how business really works or the economic cycles, mm. you know. But anyway, that's another subject. But uh, it is, it is going to have impact on the whole world, you know. You think you should more than turn their electricity off because they can't afford it, you know. What were you saying? You think Yahushua might, as he says, have to come back early because there might not be anybody left, as in nuclear fallout? Yeah, I think it's probably a nuclear thing. And, you know, the thing of it is, just today I heard on the, uh, uh, the news that Israel, earlier today, there were several ships coming towards Gaza. And the Israeli Navy was trying to divert them. And they stopped them. And they, they said... Turn, turn up to this other port so that we can, you know, we'll let you in that other port, and they refused. So they decided later on to board the ships, and I don't know, I haven't heard what they found, if anything. But see, the missiles are being shipped in from somewhere, and they're launching missiles now, and Israel is only going to take so much, you know, battering. I mean, if you're uh, right there, if, if, if the United States was being if the missiles were flying from some border city in, from Mexico, and our government was just saying, please stop, you know, if they wouldn't just say, please stop. They would hammer them really hard. There would be no, no uh, doubt. And Israel acts, and then they get all this criticism ar around the world. But uh, these people are cowards because they're firing from civilian areas. You see, that's just not done. You know, but they do that in order to be have human shields around them. And Israel tries as much as they can to not harm civilians. But these people that are firing the missiles, they're they're basically not armed, uh, uniformed army people, or you know, they're not combatants themselves. Mm. So it's mm. kind of difficult to. It's it's a terrible situation. Mm. But, uh, the media seems the media that we have here seems to be siding with the Palestinian idea. Of course, that's a fake word anyway. But you know, yeah. Anyway, it's a sad thing to be watching. Yeah, 
anyway, Israel could at any moment be attacked from Iran or any uh, number of directions by obviously some Iranian force, but um, or Israel might preemptively take Iran out, you know, and then the beginning of the end starts, you know. But uh, of course, uh, I, I don't know. We 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 really can't speculate exactly what's going to happen. But most of us understand that the second three and a half years of the of the seven year last final week of Daniel, the seventieth year, or his seventieth week. I mean, the seven years. The first three and a half are are done because Messiah, you know, he was the one that started his ministry in the. In the, during the Feast of Tabernacles, and then three and a half years later, he ended his ministry by ending the sacrifice, which is what Daniel is talking about, uh, the messenger that revealed to Daniel. And then the, everything's put on hold right now. And then the second, the last, the second half of the week, the, the second three and a half days, will, the clock will start again in, at some Passover period. And then Messiah, three and a half years later, will come back. So apparently the clock hasn't started yet, but some fortresses will have to be built probably in Israel, either Tel Aviv or Jerusalem. The fortresses of the Maitreya or the, the anti-Messiah will set his fortresses up. And then I hope that we'll all be on the same page together as Nazarene and go, we've got to get along. We have to see, this, is, this thing's happening right now. And we'll all be together on the same page. And we'll be, you know, shaking the Christians and saying, please, wake up. It's happening now. You have to get into the covenant. And they, a lot of them might say, well, what do I have to do? Well, all you have to do <laughs> is acknowledge the name, be immersed, and keep his commandments. You know? And then go and teach others. You know? And then, uh, you know, some of them are going to go, oh, I don't know, that sounds kind of Jewish. That's legalistic. <laughs> and legalistic. I'm, I'm saved by the blood. Yeah. And indeed you are. You know, you just don't want to be in the second resurrection, do you? You know. Yeah. Yeah, we want to be in the first one. Hmm. You know. But it isn't our choice, but it is our decision to make, to obey, you know. And you were saying during that uh, immortality time we were doing a couple of years ago that you think underground in these uh, secret labs that they, they you think it might culminate in that one anti-messiah person they're trying to, to breed a shell of some sort some kind of superhuman being so that the I guess Satan, Satan can inhabit them or something like that you were saying. It would make sense that the adversary would be in the person yes if not a person that was born naturally or an artificial type entity that was the, the shell would be born from a, a test tube you know mm. a, a womb you know uh, it would be manufactured in a test tube and then put into a woman and then birthed and then grown and then inhabited but not have any kind of um, true mother or father you know but just you know because you can take a you know a, a zygote and put it into a woman and it'll attach itself to the uterus and it will grow and grow into a child and then be born but it may not have any kind of inner presence you know it would just be a shell okay. as they would say uh, having no soul you know yeah. and you know they a lot of drummers have been flashing these bumper stickers around our city that says Drum machines have no soul. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But anyway, that would be that. <laughs> So this is a very nice environment here, isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Is there are there any uh, pools or waterfalls? There's a. Um there's a river in the background, a little pirate ship keeps going past. Uh, pirate ship? A pirate ship, yeah. Don't ask me why there's a pirate ship in Babylon. That doesn't make sense. Well, but, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, maybe he's caught in a time warp, but uh, it's probably some uh, 
descendants of those Vikings. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love the Viking thing. It was really well done. Yeah. Very well done. Yeah. Mm. We'll have to uh, we'll have to get our instruments on this show at one point. You'll have to sing us a song. You got a good voice. Well, you do, and I oh, could. Uh, Amy does. I don't. I just. Oh, Amy's voice is so awesome. That's a voice. We're, we're just blown away by it, the things that she's done. And yourself. I mean, you I, know, sound you're like, I sound like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> oh, no. No, I think people really enjoy it. Do you and, sing? Uh, I haven't yet, but uh, I guess I could. I haven't ever tried. But... Uh, yeah, maybe we could do that. You know, when, when when we move there, or when you move here, maybe we could do some things together. Mm. And you could teach me how to, you know, break out into the singing thing. Well, if we moved there, what's it, what's it like? We'd have to set up a, a salon of some sort, because I've got a six, five kids here. So I'd have to be working. So what, uh, is it easy to set up a business over there? Like set up a shop, salon? Well, you don't want to be here probably because of the taxation. It's horrible. You know, yeah. the taxes are so high. Business is really being, like I say, production is being hurt and harmed. Hardly anybody can even find work because employers that have been in long, well, just in the last week, there was a, a business that was similar to ours, and, and they, they were, a year ago, they moved near us, hoping, I guess, that they would be able to survive better if there were two of us. Uh, they were about a mile further down the same road, and they were hurting. And they had like 20 employees or more than 20 employees, and they moved to this location within our same block. And just this last week, they closed their doors. So that was bad news. I mean, I don't, see, I don't think about comp competition. I think that it's not about that. I think that it's more draw from the uh, general area if two places are there doing similar things. But they didn't survive. The owner uh, announced that they were having to close. And business, businesses are closing pretty regularly. So starting one up is really hard to would, get it going. What would happen if your, uh, not that you'd want it to, what would happen if your business had to shut down? What would you be? What happens to the debt? Your debt? Can you file bankruptcy and just walk away clean? Or you could. Yes, I don't. I don't like to do that. You know, it's like um, right now. I feel like a, there's a, an analogy that someone once cooked up. It involves a big pot of cream. You know, you put cream into this big pot, and two frogs jump into the pot by accident, and one and they can't get out. They're, and they're swimming. And, they, and one of the frogs says, well, I, I'm going to give up. I, I don't see any hope. I, I can't get out of here. And I'm, I, it looks like I'm going to drown. So he just gives up. He says, bye-bye now. And then he drowns. The other one says, I'm going to keep swimming until I get tired. So he just swam in circles and circles and eventually churned the cream into butter. And then he just crawled out. So I'm kind of feeling that way. I feel like we're in our 20th year, uh, 20th worst year in history. Last year was our worst year in 19 years. This year is even worse. You know, business is continuing to go down, but everybody's doing the same thing. I talked to the man at the hardware store, and he can't believe how bad things are. You know, and I've got one employee right now, and that's it. I had five a year ago. Mm or a little over a year ago. She's been with us just over a year. And when she came to work for us, there were four other girls working there. Hmm. Uh, Bob and I only hire one sex because the reason for that is because when we had one guy there, or actually we had two, one of the, the one guy there and, and, and girls, it didn't work out. You know, there were, there were problems. So, I mean, real serious problems and uh, we didn't want to ever do that again. So, yeah. anyway, so we made it that policy. But anyway, the thing of it is, though, uh, we went from five in a little over a year to one, and that's not good. But, you know, you whoever could be in it, if, if you guys were to move here and start a salon, you could actually have it in the same building with uh, 
Strawberry Island's uh, Torah's, Torah Institute, because mm. there's plenty of space on the first floor. Mm. But it would involve some plumbing. You know, you, you could probably take up half the floor. We've got about 2,800 square feet on the floor. You need, you, passing, you need, you need, how passing, much? You need passing trade, though, for hairdressing. Is, it, uh, is, it, is there passing trade, people walking past all the time? Not walking past, no. Mm. They're all driving. Mm. This would be, uh, presently it's a two-lane road, but it's about to turn into a three- or four-lane road with shoulders. Wow. You know, they're, they're, the state plans on it widening it, but mm. um, since they're out of money, they haven't been able to do that. But mm. They have uh, done some preliminary work, but uh, 1,400 square feet would be easily allocatable, you know. Mm. You know, there would be uh, men's and women's bathrooms, and um, the plumbing isn't there yet. I mean, we've got the capability to put sinks in, I guess, but that would take a lot of money. Hmm. Yeah. How much is? How many square feet does your salon have right now? Uh, about eighty-five, I think. Eighty-five well, square. That's meters, uh, square meters. I don't know what feet are. Okay. Three, three feet to a meter, I think. Yeah. So it's 85 square meters. Okay, so it would be uh, 9 times 85. Seven hundred sixty-five. No, that, no, no. Yeah. Square feet. 765 square feet. Hmm. Well, we could easily give you 1,400 square feet. Let's double that. Unless I'm okay times yeah it would be about double hmm. interesting yeah interesting hmm. and, well uh, we, uh, we have a five year plan here well that's you know you say plan but uh, just to pay our bills and uh, and sell this business and uh, we were planning to go back up north but who knows what can happen in five years well, yes. Why don't we see what Yuhu has in mind? Yeah, that's the thing. I, I don't really care where we end up. <laughs> as long as we're doing well, what he wants us to do. Yeah, wherever he needs us to be. You know, it's fine with me. Um, when you've seen this building. Yeah, yeah. When I was talking to you about the, the bankruptcy thing, um, about when I was growing up in my teenager years, I was addicted to spending money and and guns the malls and spending up big time and buying cars and smashing them and all sorts of things. And so I ended up raking up about 80, by the time we got married, I think I was about 85 grand in debt. And we were just, um, I was just working for Chris and Victoria and, uh, on a wage and I was just, we were just, um, dr drowning practically. And so yeah. we, um, we went bankrupt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as young, and everybody, you know, poo pooed us for it, but, we would still be paying off all that debt now if we hadn't. Um, yeah. And yeah. seven and seven seven years later, it's gone off your record. So, wow. As if it never That's happened. probably about the way it is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to have to do it if I if it had to happen. You know, it would be fine. Uh, I I would really uh, want to keep swimming around until that was impossible. But yeah. you know. Uh, because uh, in, in one case, uh, the two frogs, the one frog is a metaphor for somebody that went bankrupt. But mm. the other one would be just swimming around until something started to change, you know. And that thing that changed was the butter, you know, yeah. the cream. But we're basically just drowning. I mean, right now, we're just swimming as fast as we can mm. to keep the bills paid. Yeah. Uh, and I guess some of the people might think that we're just flush with money. If we were, why are we still in debt? You know? Uh, well, how, how can people think that? Like, what is, I don't know. Um, I don't, I'm driving a, a, a truck that was made in 1998. Yeah. And Phyllis's car, and I'm, we're blessed to have both, uh, is a 1997. And they're both uh, getting very, very old. They're rusting a little bit. We were trying to take care of them, but we, we do take care of them. And, you know, these are the, uh, we, if we were making money, 
uh, and keeping it, we have to put money in from what we make, mm. everything. And it's, it's a matter of, uh, well, wouldn't we like, want to buy a newer car, you know, or something? Mm. You know, yeah. You know, in fact, Phyllis is saying, this thing's getting old. Her window doesn't work. The electric is, you know, I mean, it's yeah. nice that she has electric windows, but her, her driver window doesn't work. Yeah. The, uh, oh, there's lots of problems. It has an oil leak. The, uh, the thing that I think it's called a, some kind of a thing in the, I forget what it's called. But it's a, it, there's a big uh, part of the engine that bolts down on top and it's got a seal mm. and it's uh, leaking. And it's leaking. You know, I don't know, just a little, but it's messed up. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it cost $3,000 to get a new one. And I, it's just a little, because you have to pull the uh, top of the engine off. Yeah. And uh, so we can't afford that, you know. Yeah. We'd have trouble just going to a dentist, you know, and finding the money to pay a dentist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I pray for James Trim and his family because I know that uh, he's got children to take care of, and I hope people will send him support. People need to take care of James Trim because, see, he's got bills that have to be paid. Mm -hmm. And this last month, the sales were horrible for his HRV, his HRV. And we need to get people to buy those, and and his sales need to come up and contributions to support him. I mean, it wouldn't take that much. What's an yeah. HRV? Uh, the Hebrew Roots version. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, that's uh, his translation. Yeah. And that would be a wonderful thing if people would get it. So it's a big one. I mean, it's a big book. It costs $10 just to ship it from one city to another. Mm. It's pretty. Mm. How are you going for books? You um, How's Fossilized Customs going? Is it, is it a 10th edition on its way yet? Or? Well, uh, Phyllis keeps pressuring me to get busy. I'm already busy <laughs> as can be. I said, well, if I could just find, you know, some time to work on these things. I, I want to add some more material to that, and I have to get the Torah Zone re, revamped a little and add some things to that, and we're going to have to reprint that pretty soon. So the second edition of Torah Zone is going to be essentially the same book, but it's going to be, you know, there's going to be some corrections and typos and things made, and then maybe a, an article or two added to it. Hmm. But... I've got to find time to do that. Oh, we can help you do that. Like, pardon? We can, we can help you do that. What program do you use? Well, I, uh, I have it all loaded in my computer here. Mm. All I have to do is get find time to do it. You, know? yeah. How many you got a video, aren't you? Uh, are, are you making a video? I've turned the forward and introduction into a... Uh, it's a video book, Fossilized Customs video book. So... You, uh, you're watching it and you're listening to it. Now that sounds great. Yeah. I always wanted to see the movie Fossilized Customs. <laughs> yeah. What? What's, what's that? Mm. <laughs> what's this thing? And you know, on the marquee, there it is. Let's go. Yeah. And uh, people go, uh, I'd like to take you out tonight. Where are we going to go? I don't know. Let's go to a movie. How about that? Well, what's playing? Oh, there's this new movie, uh, Fossilized Customs. You know, and I think Constantine's involved. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And the, you know, the Constantine monster song could be in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need a bit it's, more, uh, we need a bit more believers coming into, with more uh, big time Hollywood skills. Because we're just tinkering so far. Oh, no, there was, there's been <laughs> movies. Uh, there was a very successful movie that somebody made with a little tiny can, mm -hmm. a little tiny camera out in the woods, you know, you know. Mm. Oh, the, um, the Blair Witch. Oh, yeah, it was some kind of a thing like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It involved some kind of uh, spooks or something. Yeah. How, many books, how many books do you normally get run off when you print them? Do you print them yourself or? Well. You send them some oh. No, we don't print them. We don't have any capabilities, but there are printers in the park, uh, the business park that we are located in, which is just about a kilometer away from this huge mega Christian outfit, you know, that's called Southeast. Mm -hmm. And I pray for them every day. 
you know, the leaders and the people that are there. Uh, and anyway, I'd like to see more cooperation and teamwork between our facility and theirs. And, you know, but anyway, they're just a, about three quarters of a mile down or six tenths of a mile or so, a kilometer or so. And anyway, in the park, there are a number of printers that can print books. And I uh, usually talk to one or two of them, and I'll go, well, what's your best price? And then I go over to the other one, well, what's your best price? Well, they'll do it for this. How about that? And then they go, well, we'll do it for this. And they will go, yeah, well, we'll just let you do it then. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, is, there's two or three of them that have printed the books mm -hmm. in the park, and they know me, you know, and they're, mm -hmm. and they're always, well, they send me emails and, and letters and things, and they say, well, whenever you're ready, you know, let's do something. And uh, how many so thousand I, right there? Yeah, how many thousand do you normally get run off? Well, it can be anywhere from five to ten thousand, mm. you know, usually. Uh, Phyllis has been encouraging me to, to try to just get three thousand made at a time so that we don't have to store so many, you know. But mm. if we could get five thousand, that would be efficient, you know. Mm. That sounds like a lot, but uh, most of the runs that we've made. Most of the editions had uh, at least 10,000. I haven't ever seen anything less than that, at, at least not since the first edition. I think the first edition was 5,000, if I, my memory serves. And then my uh, second or third edition was 30,000, I think it was. Ooh. So there's been a lot of different numbers popping around. I can't remember exactly, but most of the time it's never been less than 10. Mm. So there's a lot of those books out there around the world. How many ninth editions did you get done? 10,000. 10,000. And what are you down yeah. to? Well, we're halfway through them, roughly. Yeah. Mm. So I'm not really in danger of needing to reprint them soon, but yeah. I could probably go another eight or ten months. That's a mate. That's... Now we know why you're so hated. That's so many, th that's like 100,000 books or so in the world. Oh, it's more than that. More than yeah, that. It is. it's 135,000, I think it is. Because, you know, I had book printed some many editions of the fascicles uh, ever since like 1986 or 87. It started in 1986 or 87. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't put dates in the books, but uh, and then the first uh, actual book came out in 1997. Mm -hmm. you know? wow. So for 10 years, I was putting out Fossilized Customs, Fascicle 1, Fascicle, and Fossilized Customs, Fascicle 2. And fa and there were four fa fascicles. Mm -hmm. you know? Have you ever seen those? No, no. I should bring them so that I don't have any here that yeah. I know of. And uh, I should bring them and show them to you. Because Amy wants to write a book. She Wonderful. Wants, she wants to write a book about uh, Torah, Torah kid, you know, raising children in the Torah and nutrition and oh, just all those sort of things. Yeah, just things that she's learned. Yeah. Let me see if I if I can find something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I see one. I've got a library on the shelf here. Actually, several shelves. Let's see what this one is. Fossilized Customs, Historical Sun Cults, Fascicle 1. This is my first one. What is it this is what... Historical uh, Sun Cults. Wow. Historical Sun Cults. Mm. And it says, see definitions in glossary, Fascicle 2. Mm. Oh, I had a glossary in, sec in, in the second fascicle. Anyway, the fascicle is just a fancy word for part yeah. or a portion, you know, a portion of something larger. Fascicle. Anyway, there's our man. He's got his little ding dong, ding dong, you know. I don't know if it's a wine cup or a bell. Bring but anyway, it closer. That's huh? Bring it closer. Okay. Ah, yeah. Historical sun cult. And then down here it says, uh, most important note, be sure to finish reading fascicle one before moving on to fascicle two. <laughs> and then the back of it, 
it has a depiction of the rosary, yep. and it looks a little bit like a big op. Yep. And it discusses a little bit about the rosary. And of course, uh, there's me as a young man. <laughs> Phil 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 with the long yeah. hair. Wow. Oh, yeah. That's just a little picture of me in the back. And not, not that I was boasting. It was just something I, I wanted people to understand who the author was. And yeah. A lot of books have pictures of the author. But, oh, yeah. You know, that's it's the, it's the last page. You know, come on. It's not like, hey, but I, I've got my, my picture in some of the earlier pages. But here's some more pagan symbols. Yeah. This is the inside cover. Let's see? Can you see a little bit of that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, anyway, just goes on and on. Uh, and this this doesn't seem to have any page numbers either. So that was before I knew about page numbers. <laughs> but, you know, Phyllis has been hammering me for a long time to go back and review and do some things over that were never recorded. Mm. You know, seminars that I've had. There were a lot of seminars that I had when we were at the bank building mm. at, at that facility, and they were never recorded. Well, that'll make it easy for you as far as research. Redo something. That'd be great. Yes, it would. But put a uh, modern spin to it. Put a modern spin to it. Yeah. 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 And in, well, the news, I, in the newsletter, uh, Phyllis was saying, as she sent through stuff, that you're putting together another immersion study. What's wrong with the, other, what's wrong with the last one? You know, that is another one that would be a good one to do. Mm. I think, didn't we record that? I don't know if we did. I don't think I recorded it. No, I, I did a documentary on it. That's where it was. And it's wonderful. But if I was to do another one, it wouldn't uh, be exactly, well, it would, it would contain all the uh, main elements. However, I want to bring up something that is a concern for a lot of people. And that is the people that say, but I have to go to see someone, don't I? You know, and it would be nice if they did. But here's the thing. Uh, it's it's a matter of what they're saying, not what somebody else next to them is standing there is saying. And that's what the main difference to me is. When we understand the tradition that came from that, we sometimes are uh, accepting the fact that someone else is baptizing us or immersing us in the name when in fact we're the one that's making the pledge and it's our conscience and our commitment no one else's and we have to utter with our own voice but here's the th here's the precedent the precedent is hidden away although some people do touch on it in the book of second kings i believe it is if you will read the whole chapter of Second Kings, chapter chapter five. Yeah, it's uh, the subject of the chapter is Elisha, and Elisha, and you have this. All the you have all the answers it, uh, on your wall, do you? Yeah, back here in the Hanging Gardens, yeah. we've got the. Uh, We've got these words that are just hanging in space. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and his name is Naaman, or Naaman. His name is, usually is pronounced Naaman. And he's some kind of an Assyrian battle general. And he, I remember that story. Yeah. And he's raiding some of the Israelite camps. And he takes a young girl out of one of the camps. And she becomes a servant in his house. And she and this, this kidnapped servant girl from Israel says my master would not be so would have to suffer so badly if you would just go see Elisha he could heal you <laughs> and he uh, thinks nothing of it for a while and then says well why not let me just go do that and then he goes on this long journey I mean a long journey yeah. and he goes to see Elisha and he's gets there, and a servant of Elisha's comes out and says, what's going on? And he says, I'm here to see Elisha. And he says, he runs in and tells him that he's out there. Elisha won't even get up and go out and see him. So the servant says, Elisha said to go do this and this and this. 
And then the, it, Naaman gets real mad. He goes, he won't even come out here and talk to me. He wants me to go over here and dip myself in the Jordan River, the Arden River. And uh, seven times. There was supposed I, to be a filthy I, I, river, wasn't it? Huh? There was supposed to be a was filthy it? river, wasn't it? An insult? Well, it might have been a little muddy. Mm. Uh, pictures I've seen of it. But he says, you want me to do what? <laughs> seven times? And then he says, I've got cleaner rivers over where I come from. I could have done it there. You know? But he, he, so he's really mad, and he storms away. He, he's pulling away, he goes down the road, and then the servant runs after him and says, uh, if he said to do something really complicated, you'd do it, wouldn't you? But you won't do this simple thing. Huh? And he goes, all right, I'll do it. And then he does it, hmm. and his skin comes up like a little child's skin. And he's perfectly well. Hmm. So... He's wanting to pay Elisha, you know, but he doesn't. He doesn't. He, Elisha won't accept any money. So then the, the servant gets the idea, wait a minute, I'm going to go down and track him down and go, I think he changed his mind and he takes some money, you know, from him. And uh, that was bad. Bad things happened. But it's, I think, Second Kings chapter 5. Anyway, that's an example of someone going and doing something all by themselves, if necessary. And that was a picture, and it's often even spoken of by Christian teachers in their teaching of immersion. And yet they fail to see that Elisha is nowhere near when he goes into the water. Now I know that it would be ideal if we could do that, you know, like the Ethiopian servant, or the, the eunuch, that Philip both then Philip and the Ethiopian went down into the water. You know, so uh, that's wonderful, you know, if that can happen. So let's let's promote, you know, someone that's a teacher taking their student into the water together if possible. But if, if you're not near a teacher and you want to make the covenant, enter the covenant, become an Israelite, then that's all you have to do. You know, just do it. Do what Naaman did and, you know, you'll be okay. Because we are, we have leprosy. We have the leprosy of sin. You know. Yeah. What was that? That's uh, my children let loose now. I have to go. Okay. <laughs> I'll be well, in trouble. Thanks. I'll be in trouble now. We've had two and a half hours of fun. <laughs> oh boy. Well, thank you, Mark, and you have a good Sabbath. What's what's left of it? You too, mate. Okay. We'll talk to you later. Bye bye. Bye bye.